Yeah. I'm giving them to everybody, but I'm out. Good afternoon. Oh, excellent. Is it working or no? I can't actually. Sounds OK? Works? Yes. All right. This is the Cider Ops meeting at IETF 101. If somebody could reach back and close the door, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Chris. This is Kayer. Hi, guys. Quickly about the mics. Please talk into the mic. Mm -hmm. Don't talk like this. Don't gradually get a whole bunch louder and scare people in the room. Can you not hear me regularly? Maybe it's okay. Sorry. Anyway, you can put the mic on the thing here. You can hold it in your hand. There's a clicker for the presenters. I'll have a clock that'll go and give you the two minute warning by being super loud. Now we move forward. 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 <laughs> oh, wait, I know what it is. Yeah. No, no, Focus Falls Mouse. Wait, Focus Falls Mouse. No. No, it'll work. <laughs> okay. There's a note well. I'm sure you've seen it at least once on this trip already. Quickly read it. I'll make it fuller, smaller next time. We have an agenda. I think there's one item we want to add to the very end or want to request to add at the very end, and that's to chat just really quickly about protocol level security stuff. Jeff Haas gave a presentation at the IEPG, which you can get from IEPG.org to see. But basically, it talks about um, some standards to be sort of standard written down. Like, if you want to do this or this or this with your protocol, here's the options you have for securing it, for identification, for uh, cryptographic uh, Sorry, for confidentiality, and, and that, that's the only two I care about right now. So that's that. We can talk about it at the very end if there's time. Otherwise, we need to find a Jabber scribe and a note sticker. We have to stop here until we find them. Jabber scribe? Hands up. You can go home. I'll send you, I'll stop the bus. Jabber scribe? Great. Jabber scribe. Now, note taker. Notes. Somebody want to write? <clears throat> the writing notes part is easy. You can do it in whatever application you like that takes text and then email to the chairs at the end. If you like using the Etherpad thingy on the data tracker, you could do that. Not my, not my first choice, but notes. Notes. Jeff wants to take notes. He said no one takes notes. Damn it. That's, that's the problem with the ultimatum. I'm going to be the worst parent ever and not follow through. Notes? Jeff? Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. It's all about finding a compromise, just like with kids. Oh. Uh, OK, so I think we'll flip right quickly through the status of all these things. There, These are the drafts. You can get all this content off of the uh, data tracker, the materials link for the meeting. All these are just what's on the drafts page on tools. Um, does anybody have any questions about the current set of status other than LTA use cases, which is probably my fault? Why don't y'all fix after the meeting? Should we working group last call? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, Tim Rhymes of Stripe NCC. I had a question about RPI tree validation last call because I think the last call went out, but I'm not sure whether it is. That's probably also or... something I'll fix after this. So. Uh, tree validation. 
As always, if I'm messing up, you should speak up. Uh, I think the only thing we have that's currently pending all of the, the other things is the stuff in the editor queue for BGP sec rollover. That's just waiting on editor doing stuff, I think. No questions? Presentations. Okay. Uh, Daniel, where are you? Sweet. It's not Daniel. It's Harris. 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 Great. Awesome. Here you go. Here's your clicker. You can use the thing. I'll get your slides up. So this is the next piece. Uh, yes. Yeah. But I have to. Damn it! It's a wrong window. So with the rubber. Testing. It's right there. Over. Show. Is that the right colors? Let's All right. Okay. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm not Daniel Kopp. Uh, I'm uh, Aris Lambrianidis from AMSEX. I'm doing the presentation on uh, behalf of the authors, uh, simply because I had a glass of wine and uh, I can take comments now. Um, so I'll try to be succinct here. Uh, I'll try to explain what the problems are that we're trying to solve. Uh, the draft here is about trying to ease clients into the world of uh, RPKI. So basically, mostly in shared mediums like uh, IXPs, uh, for which the draft was uh, originally intended, um, we might be running into the issue of people not wanting uh, to run RPKI for whatever political, technical, or business reason. So what we try to do here is to translate RPKI into a community and send it over through uh, for example, uh, IXP route server. That's the first goal. The second one is to standardize uh, the already ongoing process of uh, what we've seen has been going on in the market, which is IXPs trying to communicate that kind of information to their clients. So instead of having fragmentation and everyone doing their own thing in a segmented way, we just want to standardize and consolidate into a single community. So a family-friendly uh, diagram here. Uh, we have, for example, ASD that is advertising the prefix, any prefix into a route server. The route server does stuff to it. Uh, maybe it drops it. In any case, it would tag it. And depending on its configuration, it would then forward it to the other uh, peers. Do note that this is the same case as for uh, non-IXP environments. So it's just that the use case here is prominently for IXPs. Uh, the history here, unfortunately, is not accurate, but the key takeaways is to uh, say that the most important updates for the draft have been to incorporate feedback with regards to generalizing the draft to uh, BGP speakers instead of just IXP route servers, and then uh, also uh, reusing the four octet extended uh, BGP community um, with an additional code point that I'll describe later on. Um, this is the encoding here. Um, basically, uh, the salient points are that the validation state is the last octet, um, uh, which basically is either one, uh, zero, one, or two. Uh, so it's either valid, um, unknown, or invalid. And then uh, we're going to be requesting a specific uh, code point for the subtype. By the way, something that I forgot is that the signaling AS, which is, uh, in our case, the XP route server, is going to be on the global administrator field. Uh, then we have um, basically uh, described three modes of operation. Um, the simplest one being that we simply tag prefixes and then send them over to peers. So this is identical to how uh, normal route servers uh, operate uh, with the extra addition that uh, those prefixes are being tagged according to their uh, raw validity status. The second mode is to drop uh, invalids and tag the rest. And the third one is uh, drop invalids and uh, unknown. 
There have been some concerns about uh, path hiding. I think that uh, RFC 17947 basically addresses most, if not all, of these concerns. So there's nothing new under the sun here. Um, if people filter out ROAs before they do the BGB best pass selection, then everything works uh, pretty fine. And that's, again, uh, something that uh, they can opt to. If they don't want to, they can also uh, drop them and err in the side of security instead of uh, availability, let's say. Um, lastly, because um, there has been some uh, contentious discourse in the mailing list about this, we feel that it's it makes more sense to just um, stick on the technical side of things, um, describe a way of how people can implement it for their own environment, whether that's a, a business one, a research one, or whatever, and then for any other issues, uh, security concerns, or anything else, it's probably a better idea to have um, uh, an extra draft with more examples and more detail. And I think that's basically it. So at this point, I would be interested in questions. I got there first. <laughs> <laughs> Job Snyders, NTT Communications. Um, through a series of trick questions, I would like to see if we can establish a better understanding of the proposed mythology. Does the IP4 prefix 80.249.208.0/21 ring any bells for you? Yeah, that's the MZX peering then. And you would agree that if a slash 22, a more specific, would be propagated through the default tree zone, it would be very unfortunate. For the most part, yes. Depends on the configuration of the directly configured peers. But, yeah. So many, many IXP peering land participants, uh, their sessions would drop because the more specific route uh, wins the BGP control plane traffic. But that depends on their configuration as well. So if I would receive this slash 22 from a peering partner or uh, a customer that somehow managed to sneak through my uh, IRR-based filters, and I then propagate it onwards to you, to my other peers, to other customers, but clearly mark it with a BGP community, I feel that none of us are getting any benefit from the ROA that exists for this specific uh, uh, prefix. And, and my main obstacle with this draft is that if there is poisonous information, you should any BGP speaking entity that knows that it is poisonous information, because the route server in this draft is aware of the validation state, should not mark it with a community and distribute it, thereby amplifying the problem. They should uh, always be encouraged to drop the invalids. Um, can I can I comment on this? Yeah, of course. So I'm inclined to agree, but I would also say. Firstly, that it depends on the environments because this draft could still be applicable to research environments that are not connected to the internet at all, for example. And secondly, because it could be, and it is a large discussion, it's probably a good idea to have it as a different draft. So if we're talking about best operational practices, let's just make another draft. I'm, I'm aware of the trick to deflect criticism to separate drafts. I've used it myself a few times, but I don't think we can uh, use that card here. Uh, but on the technical it's side, not a trick. Okay. The, there are two concerns related specifically to using BGP communities. Uh, one is the timeline of deploying a new extended community. Uh, not all implementations allow you to just put in hexadecimals and, and go with it. Many implementations require that there is actual a form of support. So even if you standardize today and implementations happen in the next 18 months, then deployment happens in the 18 months after that. Uh, use large PHP communities deployment cycle as an example of how long these things take, even at full speed. Um, realistically, this, this then becomes in the hands of end users four years from now, and I hope that four years from now, we've made way more headway uh, regarding RPKI origin validation than this draft proposes. Well, but we could also say the same thing four years ago. 
and we didn't. But we didn't. Exactly. So I cannot we cannot have any guarantees to that. What I can guarantee you is that we, if we don't standardize, which is one of the goals on this thing, four years down the road, we're gonna be having uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna be having uh, 50, 80, 100 XPs doing their own thing, which is a nightmare for customers. Well, it's not necessary. Okay. Last but comment, that's a, last comment from my side. Okay. I also feel uh, it has not been sufficient. Uh, sufficiently justified why locally significant communities, namely using the ASN of the route server uh, and just documenting uh, uh, this community means that the route server made this observation, why that is insufficient and why it has to be a extended community. Because right now, I think, believe your organization uh, has the capability to tag uh, the announcements. Correct. And you publicly document 6667 colon one two three means A and colon one two three four means B. Correct. Um, why is that not sufficient? The answer to that is because the weight of what we're saying in our own website is not the same as that to an RFC. Hmm. Yep. Uh, Alexander Zimov, Curit Labs. Uh, I have a more general uh, question. So, uh, IRA filters and RPK are both m methods to filter out invalid routes. And uh, authors are representing huge IXs that you have already implemented IRA filters. So you can't say that so you are not uh, uh, working with routes, you are just sending them in all directions and so on. So my question is, if we have two methods that have the same goal, why do you are uh, trying to treat them differently? Uh, you mean IRR filtering and RPKI filtering? Yeah. So For example, you, you, uh, uh, you may also tag uh, your prefixes that are invalid according to IRR and send it to your customers. So why in this situation you are uh, do it uh, do it that way, and why in another situation you do it another way? That's a very good question. Uh, my personal opinion to that is because RPKI generally has a more sol solid foundation in terms of standardization compared to IRR. So IRR is already, IRR filtering is already problematic uh, as it is based on the fact that people are already doing it way too fragmented, but it could be the case that we might address this in a different uh, draft as well. So. Oh. Uh, my idea was different. So it's that you should uh, treat them uh, both uh, in the same way. Yes, it's uh, it is correct, but you should filter them both out. So uh, the second question, okay, let's imagine that uh, you've managed to make this draft adopted and it's became an RFC. Do you really believe that your customers, majority of your customers will be using such a community to do, uh, to trick the BGP decision process? It's uh, I, uh, from my perspective, it is. Uh, with, uh, it is. Um, I don't think it will be. Our, all, our customers implied. are already doing that. The difference the is the majority of your customers. No, but customers are already doing that. So the problem here to solve is whether we standardize the thing, this thing across more IXs. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Radio for Deutsche Telekom. I failed to provide a draft and presentations on ideas how to use the expanded general community code space that we have. Uh, that expanded code space quite clearly allows for, oh, say, having Euro IX as a coordination of the IXP operators uh, acquiring an AS number that could be used to publish the common repertoire suggested by, uh, by EuroIX as common semantics communities. And uh, maybe, maybe the Asian uh, IX operators uh, are lazy and would just say, well, okay, for our customers, we are pointing to that same registry. Um, there are quite definitely now easy ways uh, and yes, it would be really good to have a draft and finally an informational or BCP uh, RFC 
that explains a common way of doing this. And the, and the benefits would be, as Job was pointing out, deployment of new reper uh, <coughs> routing repertoire becomes much more agile than with the old ext uh, extended communities. There is also another benefit when you use the regular open uh, community attribute, and that means that not only and, uh, one does not have to wait until uh, the router vendors provide the new software version that understands and implements the semantics, potentially, of uh, the thing. It also means that as far as control of propagation of signals can be implemented by operators, that's easy with standard communities. It is absolutely not possible with extended communities as long as not everybody actually has the implementation of that. And I think that's in the case of a security relevant signaling, uh, a very, very important point. Um, and I actually have a question for you. As Can I just comment before yeah, that question? Okay, go ahead. So why just limited though only on internet exchanges? So if <laughs> Uh, the, the, the association of dog owners, of course, can get an AS number for their code point of okay. uh, marking uh, of marking dog uh, shit. Yeah? Um, okay. Whoa. The hey. question that I have, and I have an idea as to the name of that community, ITF. I just want to make the point that we are now running out of time. Three or four minutes into Sri Ron's time, so get to the point quickly. Answer quickly. So we can sure run up. Yeah, that question. You you still need to? Please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as, 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 you, as you are an IXP who is supposed to already or soon use that kind of stuff, uh, my question would be, and that's not really protocol stuff, which trust anchors are you actually using? And are you sure? Uh, are you sure? Have you checked that all the things that you are doing uh, don't have bad consequences outside of just routing? No, we're not, but we leave that decision to the customers. Uh, and, well, uh, which, well, okay, uh, if you do not, if you do not uh, specify which trust anchors are used for coming to a, a designation there, uh, the customer has to rely on the set of trust anchors that you are using. Rudiger, this is a great conversation. We probably should take it to the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Montgomery, I had a, just a quick question about scope. So, and, and I don't know what the answer is about encoding external attributes. All, all that conversation is good. But that seemed to be the only thing that this draft added. All of these descriptions of simple tagging, dropping and tagging, strip, strict dropping and tagging, you can do now. You just put names on them, right? Yes, but you also need to standardize. So you need to make sure that every operator who implements this implements one of the three modes of operation instead of 10, 15, or whatever. So you need to use a common language across operators who do that. It, that's not clear to me. Um, and one other thing I wanted to ask is, you know, there's lines in here like a validating BGP speaker must support at, at least the simple tagging operation. When it says a validating BGP speaker, do you mean a speaker that implements this spec? Correct. Or just a normal RPKI validating BGP engine? I mean to say uh, the peer who is doing the validation and sends it out as in tag form to its peers. I can't tell whether this said that every BGP speaker has to be able to do this, or if you're doing this mechanism, then you have to implement one form. If it's, it's, in it's, an, a, it's, it's about scope. If it's in an internet exchange, it's only the route server. Does that answer your question? I'll take it up offline. It's about okay. the, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No. We'll be over time. <laughs> yeah, Thank please. You so much. Thank you very much. There's a bunch of conversation here. There's a bunch of conversation here. All of it should be on the mailing list, please.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sriram, and uh, my co-authors on this are Oliver Borshert, uh, Doug, uh, and Job. Um, so this is about um, trying to be, um, hard, I mean, you'll see. Uh, we, I mean, we don't want to go to, I mean, in, in the case, we don't want to immediately go to dropping invalids, so rather have some uh, intermediate uh, transition period uh, where, where we are um, trying to route them towards uh, their uh, less specifics and at the same time uh, like uh, true, truly drop the invalids but try to route them to their less specifics. Let's get into that. Um, so valid obviously raises no concerns, not found, not penalized during partial deployment. So the question is about the invalid. So should we always drop invalid? The answer is perhaps not because network operators would like reachability not to be compromised uh, during incremental deployment or transient conditions. Unconditionally dropping invalid, uh, that we could do only in mature uh, state of RPKI deployment. Uh, so, the, so the next question is, uh, during incremental deployment state, uh, should we drop uh, invalid route only if a less specific route exists that is either valid or not found. So we call that the uh, DISR or DISR policy. Uh, this is uh, exactly that, drop in valid if a valid or not found less specific route exists. Uh, so why do we want to do that? Um, <clears throat> so if, if uh, there's a ROA uh, for the uh, subsume, subsuming less specific that exists, uh, and uh, so, uh, right. Uh, so essentially, the idea is that it uh, that you are dropping the invalids, and uh, you are routing them towards a less specific that is either uh, valid or not found. And by doing this, uh, the in invalid announcements, uh, uh, all of them uh, are dropped. Some of them could be hijacks. Some of them could be due to traffic engineering. But what we are trying to ensure in the process is that the traffic for the more specific uh, does get to uh, the, the destination it is supposed to reach. So let's look at uh, some scenarios uh, where, whether or not that truly happens. The colors kind of changed here. Um, the blue, what you see blue is, are, was yellow in my slides. <laughs> so I wonder what happened to the red. The red became pink, okay. Oh, did you just fix it? Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this case, there are no ROAs. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the scenario is AS1 is originating a slash 22. Uh, out of it, it, it also uh, originates a slash 24 uh, on, to a different uh, transit provider. Um, the, uh, in this case, uh, all of these, uh, and, and there's, there's a hijack uh, at the top uh, coming from AS5. Uh, so there's traffic engineering uh, of the more specific. There's also a hijack of the more specific, uh, and the less specific is making its way as well to the uh, AS4. Uh, so sitting at AS4, uh, these are all not, not found, and uh, we are not really differentiating in this case. Uh, they, they are all uh, in the same status. So now uh, we look at uh, a situation where ROAs come into play. Uh, so there's a ROA for, a, for the slash 22, make, which makes the more specific invalid. Uh, the traffic engineering intended one, as well as the, uh, the real hijacked one. So AS4 applies the uh, DISR policy, and it, it uh, drops all the invalids that it, it sees with the more specifics, and, routes the tra and because it sees that the less specific invalid or not found, in this case, I'm sorry, the less specific valid, uh, is covering uh, the, the more specific invalid, so it routes uh, the, tra uh, the traffic to uh, the less specific. So traffic engineering doesn't work as intended, but the traffic gets to its uh, uh, intended uh, destination. Uh, same thing happens if there is a ROA in between. The ROA was not created for the slash 22, but it was created for a 23, uh, which makes the uh, slash 22 uh, not found as opposed to valid. So, but AS4 decides to uh, choose that uh, and route the traffic to the not found uh, rather than the invalids. So again, drops the invalids and the traffic still gets to the correct destination. 
uh, in this case, uh, the uh, the less specifics are being aggregated by AS2, uh, and the ROA has been created for uh, uh, the slash 23, the aggregation. The hijack is uh, uh, is caught and uh, dropped. Uh, the traffic uh, def definitely reaches the uh, less specific through AS2, the, the more specific through AS2. No problem there. Um, so in this scenario, there's multi-homing. Uh, previous one didn't have multi-homing. So when you have multi-homing now, yes, uh, the uh, the um, traffic engineering, the the this less the more specific intended for traffic engineering, uh, is invalid as well as the real hijack is invalid. Both are dropped, and the traffic is uh, routed uh, to the uh, less specific, and the AS2 is able to distribute the traffic to the more specifics underneath it. Uh, Jeff has had, a, had a pointed out an interesting situation uh, where. Uh, um, there seems to be something to be a little concerned about uh, with this uh, DISR policy. So here uh, in this picture, uh, the slash 24 uh, more specific uh, is, uh, was a customer of AS2 and then uh, it, it ran away with, with the uh, more specific, with the, with the sub allocation and now it homes to AS3. So now uh, the DISR policy would, uh, uh, so there's a, the AS2 ISP2 has created a ROA for the uh, slash 26, I'm sorry, slash 16. Um, and um, what happens is that AS4 uh, picks, I mean, selects the uh, less specific slash 16. Uh, and what you see happening in this picture is that, uh, yes, indeed, the, uh, the slash 24 traffic goes to AS2, but it has nothing to deliver to because the customer has moved away. So the customer basically experiences unreachability. Uh, so should we be, uh, the question is, uh, uh, so, so it's a non-paying customer who has uh, stolen a, a sub allocation and ran away with it. Uh, so should he be, should ISP2 decide that it should be punished for this, that reason uh, and, and suffer non-reachability? Uh, or should ISP have some concern or compassion? Uh, and, and based on that, uh, if, if they do have some, some soft corner, Thinking that maybe the mail, the, the the check is in the mail or something like that, uh, they they can go ahead and create uh, a ROA uh, for the more specific. So that is one option uh, that that ISP two has in case they want to be soft uh, towards this customer for a grace period. All right. Uh, so we have looked at uh, uh, what are the implications of this policy. I mean, is it helping in in terms of looking at real route views and uh, ROA data? So at the top, uh, we are looking like from seven route views collectors, uh, we are looking at uh, 750,000 routes uh, of which uh, close to 60,000 are valid, 10,000 are invalid, and the rest are not found. And then further, we can um, uh, differentiate the invalids based on max length, um, max, max length mismatch, AS mismatch, both max length and AS mismatch and AS set. So let's take a look at the uh, invalids, 10,000 of them. Uh, of those, uh, uh, max length invalid are ab about 7,000, uh, uh, AS invalid about 3,000, max length and AS, uh, and both AS and max length invalid, a small number. And here we drill down, uh, look at the max length invalid and uh, ask the question, uh, is, uh, is there a, a, a valid or not? Uh, not found uh, less specific to which it can be routed or not less specific or equally uh, or the same prefix. So certainly like in uh, uh, 68,000 out of 6,800, uh, 6,000 roughly uh, are routable uh, to, uh, to a valid or, uh, or not found. And then the next question is uh, of those, uh, how many have the same origin AS and how many have a different origin AS? So uh, as expected, uh, about 6,000, I mean, almost, I mean uh, almost all of them have uh, same origin, a very small, tiny uh, fraction uh, have a different origin. And uh, uh, so that's expected because in this case, it is max length invalid. So what happened is that the, uh, the owner uh, is, is routing both the less specific and the more specific, and they forgot to put the right max length or, or they forgot to create an additional ROA uh, for the more specific. Now you can drill down on the right side just for the 40 of them which have a different uh, origin AS. And it turns out that out of that 26 of them go to the transit provider of the different OS. So it's the same path. Uh, it's just going to one AS above, which is the transit provider. Uh, 
Um, so this one, uh, so you can look through the next uh, three slides, uh, which drill down deeper into what happens when there is AS mismatch or max length and AS mismatch. So let's move on from those. So the next few slides, next couple of slides are about the implementation considerations. Uh, here, uh, we got some inputs from uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you for that. And, and I would request Jeff to uh, help me out uh, here in case I'm not saying something right. Uh, on the list, Jeff, Jeff had an objection about uh, the algorithm that is currently written in the draft. And uh, over there, we said something about like changing things in the local pref. And uh, Jeff's suggestion to me, so what you are seeing in this picture is that you have edge, edge ribbons, uh, you have the origin validation checks, then you go through the decision process, shortest path, et cetera. Uh, then uh, you put stuff into the local rib. And after that only, uh, if I understand uh, Jeff's suggestion correctly, only after that you bring in the desert policy. And uh, as you select the routes to go into the FIB or the edge rib outs, uh, that is the time when, we, when you check for the less specific. More specific is invalid. Is there a less specific that's either valid or not found? If so, then you put it in the FIB uh, or, or, or in the edge rib outs. So, that's the implementation, consensual implementation. Um, then you have to be careful about what happens when things change. Uh, so when a valid or not found route is, uh, is added, uh, at that point of time, uh, you have to check uh, if there are more specific prefixes in the uh, FIB or add rebouts uh, sub subsumed by the route prefix. And if, if uh, those more specific prefix routes uh, are invalid, then you need to remove them uh, from the edge rebouts or the FIB because the valid not found route uh, that's newly added uh, covers it. So likewise, you also have to uh, look at two other conditions. I, I'll not uh, explain those, but the, those two other conditions are uh, when a valid or not found route is withdrawn, again, you have to perform checks. Or when there are uh, changes in the RPKI state, that's once again when you need to, do the uh, to, to, to redo the checks. So that's the uh, high-level conceptual implementation. When, once we decide that uh, we, we uh, have some support for this proposal, we can uh, uh, work out the details. Um, finally, this is my last uh, slide. So here we have, uh, what we have is a gradual hardening of the stick. Uh, today, uh, invalid routes are not dropped. Uh, that is early adoption and uh, we, uh, do our best to operators do their best to notify invalid educate and encourage adoption um, among their customers uh, then we apply as as we go into actually making it uh, real uh, uh, we we use a soft soft, soft say, stick that is the uh, desert policy and uh, uh, here uh, we are assuring the uh, the um, uh, the um, the negligent uh, user who has not created a rover that uh, for the more specific, you didn't create a ROVA, but for the less specific, you have a ROVA, it's valid. We are, we, are, we are routing it to the less specific, so your traffic is not being dropped on the floor. Um, like it's, we saw in the scenarios, you are getting the traffic. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's during moderate adoption. Uh, once again, continue the efforts for notifying the invalids to the customer and educate them. And finally, the hard stick is uh, always drop invalid. That would be in mature adoption. Thank you. Cool. That, can we go one slide back? So, K. Okay, Patel, uh, one more slide back, please. Right. So, as an implementer, would you ever get a request from your provider that says, if I figure out that I really want to drop invalids, right, um, or I want to implement your algorithm, I want to do it at the point where I don't even consider decision process. I may want to optimize that. Uh, Would that require a change in the draft? Oh, so right now, uh, draft is zero, zero individual. Right. So it will go through many changes, Good. no doubt. So I suggest you provide that flexibility. That's all I was saying. And then the second question I um, have is, how many levels do you expect, assuming there is an attack, and assuming the attack happens in, in a way that someone announces more specific, and there are a bunch of less specifics that are announced. So say there was a slash. 24 followed by slash 16 followed by slash 8. How many levels should you recurse through to say when to stop? And and the answer may be 
recurs as much as you can. Okay, one is good. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you find uh, you, so you you look up the prefix tree from more specific to less specific. As soon as you find the first one uh, that is uh, less specific, I mean less, less specific that is valid or not found, you you doubt to that. And one last question. Yeah. And I'm assuming you're not counting in this check a default zero zero as a <laughs> valid order. <laughs> No, I don't think so, no. So, Warren Kamari, um, no hats. So, let's say that I... <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> let's say I end up with an invalid slash 24, and there's currently a covering slash 20 that is you know not found or something. I then hide the slash 24 because it's currently invalid. When the covering route goes away, and then comes back. It sounds like I have a fair bit of work to do. Yep. yep. It just uh, the amount of work sounds okay. John Scudder. <laughs> um, that was a good point, by the way. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that in your you know taxonomy of um, you know, different network cases. Uh, I, I think your second one showed, you know, a multi-homing case, and then your third one showed a, a prefix portability case. Um, and I just want to point out that, uh, you know, generally the point of multi-homing is also prefix portability. In, what I mean by that is if my link to my primary provider goes down, the whole point of multi-homing is that I think my traffic is still going to get delivered to me along my second path. But in your example, what you showed was, well, the multi-homing doesn't really work, but it's OK because the primary path I, still you're exists. You're saying this link could go down. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it becomes the, the following example. So uh, if this link goes down and this is withdrawn, then all you are left with is the two, the invalids. And between the invalids, uh, uh, you don't no, have, you, you, correct? You, you had a. Um, I, I guess the, the the example is you have a multi-homed customer, but the the you know yeah this one maybe? show me your prefix portability example the 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 one where you, you said oh Jeff brought up this other example oh, oh yeah okay. so okay so so basically that example but you know the customer is, isn't moved the customer is multi-homed uh, yeah and um, so so that dotted line is not really dotted it's solid. So that's extremely similar to the slide we were just looking at a minute ago. Um, now the dotted line gets broken because you know a, a squirrel chews through the, oh, uh, the fiber. Oh, just one, just one second. Oh, also, there's only two minutes left. I think the sound out of the room might have dropped out. So, should we all stop talking until the, the audio comes back? I'll stop this bus right now. Or I could count backwards from a hundred. Yeah. Um, I'll see if we can check chase sound. Anyway, do, do, do you get my point that yeah, uh, essentially in this case? Okay. Just check. Uh, so, all right. So, both are solid lines, and uh, this this one goes away. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this one goes away. Uh, yeah. And he's still announcing. All right. Right. He's still announcing the aggregate. Uh, so, uh, so that guy, you know, then gets no service. And, I mean, and he, at the same time, I mean, he uh, right. Okay. He gets. You could argue that. Oh well, that's okay because you know the. For the reason you give at the bottom, mm -hmm. but but it still you know means that, and there's a whole bunch of business ramifications to this then about about multi homing and so on that it's brought we, Chris's beeper beep so we don't have time to go into it but I I, I think that we can't just sort of you know easily dismiss the problem. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll get get conversation deeper. and mm -hmm. there's less than a minute so be quick and get quick. Job Snyder's NCT Communications. Uh, I want to emphasize that the reason we're looking into this is because there currently is zero deployment of origin validation. I am one of five <laughs> networks that does origin validation, so we're performing really poor. And I see this as an experiment, a fault experiment perhaps. How can we roll into this and incrementally uh, start protecting groups of people that uh, uh, created the correct ROA and do the correct route announcements and perhaps not yet offer benefits to people that have misconfigurations or, or 
at least try not to punish those. And I'm, I'm fully aware that this will be uh, probably be quite computationally expensive. And that alone may, you know, prevent this from ever materializing in the real world. Uh, so studies will need to be done, like what is the actual cost of this? Because I'm very concerned about resources. Um, but if people have other ideas how to roll into origin validation, I, you know, this is a good time to step forward. <laughs> Doug Montgomery missed. One quick point I'd like to make to John's point, right, is that um, you always have a problem if you're multi-homing and only creating ROAs for one path, um, at least in these kinds of examples. So you need to be consistent. There is no more time. Uh, We're all done. Next up. Thank you. Thank you. You can talk about this in the mailing list, of course, please. Magic. How does this work? Tim. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um. So um, there is a draft called Objection of Object for uh, Tell, Trust and Locator. Um, <clears throat> does this work? Now. Yes. <clears throat> so very quick reminder how this all works. We have the Trust and Locator file, which uh, essentially contains a, um, a bunch of URIs, or at least one. And they, let's say, fingerprint of the key of the trust anchor certificates. Um, this gets either shipped by default or configured by users in a relying party software. Um, it then fetches a, uh, a certificate, validates it, and um, that it matches the fingerprint, let's say. And then from there on, um, it can commence uh, validation. So <clears throat> what's the issue here? Well. Sometimes new URIs may be applicable. Um, I was going to talk about HTTPS in TELS next, so that's a potential use case. Um, but there may also be a need to have a new key. Um, in particular, in our case, we use uh, hardware security modules to protect uh, our key. Um, but uh, currently, we're kind of locked into one vendor, and it would be nice if we could change at some point. Um, if you need to communicate a new tell, then, well, it's pretty undefined at the moment. Um, they need to be installed by hand. Um, you could maybe do a hack and ship new tells with a validator and figure out where you're using this old thing, then I'll replace it, but it's, it, it's a bit, yeah, dodgy. Um, and it's hard to reach the deploy base and get people to do this. So why talk about this now? <laughs> I thought I'd put this one up. <laughs> to me, this is quite important, not super urgent. We don't have a problem right now, but you know, it's only not urgent until it becomes urgent. So <clears throat> I think we should have a good discussion about this. Um, also, given the, the uh, well, the, the, the issues with the DNS keys, I think, also show that it, it's good that we can tackle this early. So <clears throat> what is in this draft? Um, it covers planned rules, so we are planning to use a new key. Um, planned uh, uh, new publication points, but it doesn't cover um, unplanned rules. Um, well, like I tried to say in the in the in the slide about you know I think this is important, not ur urgent, but we should start talking about this. Um, I'm really open to suggestions. Like nothing in this document is cast in stone. I'm, took up the edit token on this because I think it's important enough that we start the discussion, but I'm really open to other ways that this can be done. Uh, let's get it right. So that being said, this is what the document says now. For a planned role, um, a trust anchor should set up a new key first and publish all the objects that uh, go with it, and then publish a new uh, signed tile object. Um, relying parties who see this must use it immediately. And the TA, well, that's what the current document says, must still operate the old key for at least uh, 24 hours. Um, 
I'm not sure that that's um, entirely necessary if, if relying parties have to switch over immediately anyway. Um, <clears throat> but then the third stage is uh, retire the old key. Um, but if you can, leave a pointer to uh, where the new key is. So if people arrive later, they can still uh, find their way. Then publication, adding a new publication point is relatively easy um, because you just need to publish the certificate first and then you can uh, have a trust anchor locator that references it. Uh, RPs must, this was done for cons consistency, always use this new trust anchor locator immediately. Um, so, but I have already found the certificate. So <clears throat> in this case, it would be the next run that this thing uh, becomes available, let's say. For removal, um, well, <clears throat> if you remove the only uh, location that a trust uh, a relying party has, then of course things will break. So <clears throat> it kind of assumes that you didn't do that. Um, but you're trying to phase out one of mul multiple. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, the thought here is that, okay, continue to operate this, this location for a while at least. And the document currently says 24 hours, but yeah, I'm not sure that that's the right value to be quite honest. Um, then, <clears throat> well, issues. There were some issues. Well, first of all, there's a double encoding issue, like the, the content of the tell is encoded whilst it, it doesn't have to be double encoded, let's say, as base 64. Um, that's a minor issue. There's magic times in here, like I mentioned. Um, not sure that we really need them and what the value should be. Um, everything is in immediate to me. Somebody suggested, I think it was Tom, that maybe you want to plan ahead and say, I plan to use this new thing two months from now. Um, to me, that doesn't seem like a, yeah, to me, I'm not sure that I agree with the use case there. It seems simpler to me to just do it. Um, but it's a, it's a point of discussion. Um, <clears throat> another point of discussion is, should we actually try to cover on planned rules? And if so, um, then uh, it may be a good idea to use the same mechanism both for planned rules and unplanned rules, because then we just have one way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> why unplanned rules? Well, <clears throat> If I look at our case, we do use a hardware security model to protect our keys, so the, the chance that people steal the key is very, uh, very small. Um, but you can still lose access to the key. And if you had multiple keys, then you could store them in, in different locations and maybe reduce that risk. But the expenses, and let me go here, is that it would complicate the, uh, well, the scenario that I thought of at least, how you could do this is, is more complicated than let, a simple plan roll, let's say. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Are you really you know, making things better here? Um, but okay, that said, what I had in mind was you could have the current key define a new key. Um, it's not actually being used, let's say, um, but it has the power to say the old key is no longer in use. Um, you would need a slightly more um, complicated object, I think, than a simple tell for this, because at least the way I see it, you need to then communicate what is current, what is future, and um, what is old. So um, this is not in the current document, but it was discussed uh, or uh, emailed it to the list. So uh, again, I'd like very much to have feedback on this, um, which brings me to this slide, which says uh, most of the things I've already said. So. Future changes, do people need it? Do people see a use case? I think we can look into it, but again, uh, to me, it seems that it's easier from a relying port party's uh, implementation perspective that we just deal with it when it's ready rather than, and don't keep track of when we need to do something in the future. Um, times, what should we use? And yeah, importantly, covered, uh, cover unplanned role, uh, key roles. Should we go there? Is the use case uh, strong enough um, to have potentially uh, more complicated ways of doing this? And I think that's it. Yes. So, any questions or comments? Uh, welcome. Rob Austin. Um, 
couple comments. One, the main reason for doing pre-publication in most of the, these sorts of protocols is to try to be ready for some kind of uh, unplanned key roll. You know, it's basically just to, because you can't do it when, once the events happen, You're basically rebooting. Um, second thing, in terms of your magic numbers, one way to think about it in terms of are these numbers sane, or rather in terms of whether the protocol is sane, is say you're keeping the 24 hours, which sounds aggressive to me, but for purposes of discussion, pretend you're keeping the 24 hours. What happens if somebody has been asleep for two weeks? Yeah. How badly do, does this break? Does it just magically recover? Are they screwed? You know, what's just go through the whole thing that way. Yes. Um, yeah, I agree. But uh, I wasn't entirely clear on the on the position on on plant rules that you mentioned. Um, Sorry for being a bit dense here, but uh, are you saying it's something we should cover or we should not cover? I didn't actually express an opinion no. on that, which is why you can't tell. Uh, however, that said, I know you've been looking for an excuse to use uh, JSON for the towel for years now. <laughs> um, well, actually, on the list, list I proposed XML because it's consistent yeah, yeah, with yeah, how we do it elsewhere. I expect it's easier for this because of the base 64. Um, I think we need to work through what we're going to do if we do have unplanned. Because um, you know, it's not like the problem goes away because we refuse to think about it, unfortunately. Well, <clears throat> I think one, one thing that would be useful is uh, to hear from you and, and, and uh, 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 Dee as well, as relying party um, uh, implementers. Um, how much cost would this incur on relying party software if you have to do all these checks all the time? Um, another way to think about this is uh, would uh, operators of trust anchors actually, you know, uh, do they see the need for doing this? Or are they confident that uh, using an HSM is protection enough, let's say, and having good backups? Um, but the third question is also, um, you know, does the technical community think that that's good enough? So <laughs> there's all these questions here, and uh, I don't really have the answer to all of them. But uh, yeah, maybe we should leave it at that, and then hopefully spark up some more discussion on the list. Right. <clears throat> this one should be easy. Famous last words. HTTPS and trust anchor uh, locators, tells. So it's essentially just this. Um, it said have one or more rsync URIs. Um, now the document says um, a new version has been written with my name and, and George Michelson's name on it. Uh, I reached out to authors of the original uh, RFC, actually. Um, I don't think people there were um, felt that they needed to be on the author list, but they're welcome to because the change is actually minor. It just says you can use HTTPS now, essentially. Um, you could also use only HTTPS, the, the way it's written. So one or the other. Um, why it's easier to host these things reliably, uh, and it's easier to fetch. You don't need to have, start up an external uh, 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 command like rsync, um, but there's libraries. Um, <clears throat> One thing I'd like people to look at um, is um, the HTTPS uh, consideration section. This is similar to what we've done in the data protocol. Um, uh, TLS validation is, um, well, I would say definitely somewhat useful, but people also uh, mess it up. And because you get this object and you have a fingerprint, you can actually verify that this certificate is, is valid. So. Um, there is object security there. So the advice is essentially do this, warn in case it doesn't uh, validate, and uh, but use it anyway. And it leaves it entirely to local policy um, of the relying party software to then decide, OK, maybe I want to try another URI that, that works uh, without uh, warnings. Um, so that's one thing to, to think about, I think. But other than that, I feel this is probably pretty much done and um, yeah we'd probably even go for last call very soon unless people feel a need to discuss more on this so that's i don't have a question slide here but 
consider don question mark and um, please review considerations as my uh, questions. <laughs> Any comments? Sure. And the considerations as written. Can you please, that, that it says to be removed later and then it has a suggested text that people are all fine with that text. Um, I'm fine with it. Okay. Please email the list asking for adopt or shipping. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right. Now, the fun bit. Um, yes. I think we have the uncoolest name of all the validators out there. <coughs> By far. <laughs> um, but I honestly couldn't think of a better one. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> um, We've been working on a new ver version of our RPI validator. Um, some reasons why. Um, stability, maintainability from a software point of view, um, because the old tool was written in Scala, and whilst I still think that's a pretty nice language, it's quite hard to have people, find people who can maintain it. Um, redundancy and deployment is something we want to look at. Uh, we want to reduce the memory footprint somewhat because the old one was keeping every, everything in memory. Um, and we also want to look at the deployment and update model. So um, features, it's pretty similar to the current one. Um, we have um, export of ROAS uh, and CSV and JSON that's uh, compatible with the earlier version. We have added support for router certificates and uh, RPI RTR version one that also includes router certificates. We were not doing incremental updates earlier, but we've had added this now. Um, we are working on Slurm, so that's um, the local exceptions, if you will. You can say uh, ignore a certain prefix or uh, router certificate uh, and add my own. That's in progress. We have a UI. Um, it's completely all secure, kind of by design, because we figure, well, if you want to secure it, uh, just put a proxy in front of it that you know is following the latest and greatest in, in how to do HTTPS, etc. But if we put that in our software, it will become harder to maintain. I don't think we can compete with Nginx or Apache or things like that. Um, <clears throat> API, um, the UI uses an API, the API itself uh, as well, uh, and it's browsable uh, with you can. Uh, well, it's self-documented, and, and you can try it out. Command line interface, I'm afraid we won't have time to, to build that uh, right now. But um, if anybody is willing to do work in this space, uh, we'd be very happy to work with you. Um, yeah, so that's features. Architecture. Um, <clears throat> so the what I meant, redundancy is we kind of assume that you would be running one validation engine, so that doesn't share state between, let's say, two instances of a validator. Um, but the way we've looked at the RPI RTR thing is it's a separate deployable at the moment. It uses the API. It keeps local state in case the validator is unavailable, for example, for a, uh, an upgrade. And you can have multiple. Um, well, you can have scripts using the, the API. Um, a little more on this internal. Validation versus patching, this is where we spent quite a bit of work in the internals, is um, we have a more clear separation now. We always had a local cache, but uh, now uh, we've really separated the functions to become asynchronous. So that means that if a repository is uh, unavailable, our validation process isn't blocked. Um, but it does add a bit of overhead when we first start. We need to first try all the repositories uh, under a tree, and we discover them kind of by doing incremental validations. And so there may still be things that we haven't tried yet. So as long as we haven't tried all the repositories in a tree, uh, the trust anchor is marked as pending, and uh, uh, RPK RTR doesn't include the results for it. Um, then, as soon as we do try them, uh, if they fail, they fail. But you know, at least we've tried. Um, also, well. A screenshot of uh, a one monitor page. Uh, we now list the repositories explicitly as well, in addition to uh, any validation uh, issues with objects in the in the tree. Hopefully, this will help debugging uh, 
issues uh, a bit better. Um, <clears throat> known issues, because this is still in beta. Um, reporting on pending trust anchors is still somewhat confusion, confusing. If you start up the, uh, if you download the, the, the tool and start running it, it needs to build up state initially, and uh, it's kind of reporting the object that it has found, even though it's not ready yet. So that's something we want to look at in the UI. Um, local exceptions are not completely finished, but we are looking at that and making good progress. There is no user interface for trust anchor management, so adding new trust anchors. There is an API for this. Um, this may remain a feature. What we may actually do is that we just uh, have a small script that exemplifies how you can use the, uh, uh, the API to upload a, a trust anchor locator. Um, <clears throat> so please let me know what you think. Um, it's all available on GitHub, so you can um, you can create issues there. You can talk on the list. You can talk to me personally. Everything works. Um, we're quite dedicated to fixing any any bugs and issues, but we're careful about features. We want to keep this thing maintainable, and that's also why we want to keep the feature set uh, quite minimal. For deployment, uh, we currently support um, RPMs for CentOS 7. That's because we use that internally. It's not because everybody should use it, of course, but um, we want to do what we can, let's say. Um, <clears throat> A, I made a Docker image as well, based on this, that might be useful for some people, and there's a generic build. So that, based on that, you could also figure out how to deploy it in, in other distributions. If people are interested in making distributions for certain platforms and they have some uh, authority in the, those distributions, then uh, again, we'd be very happy to work with you. And that's it, I think. So. Oh, last time again, I had one question uh, that's sort of relevant to IETF as opposed to just physical implementation. When I was implementing the client side of uh, RDP and using RIPE's enormous uh, database as the server side, I noticed very, very different behavior uh, that I had to cope with in, in my implementation in terms of the difference between uh, full transfer and incremental transfer. And the database behavior was totally different. Um, if you had any implementation experience in that area, that sort of thing that you came across while doing this, that would probably be useful for the working group to know. All right. No, I'm not sure that we encounter that. But let's let's have a chat later. Hi, Tim. Uh, Dima from ZDS. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give a suggest in terms of how to lame your software. Maybe you could rearrange every word of the lame of software. Maybe you can get a, a, a funny initials. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, given that um, the validation reconsidered uh, the amended procedure for certificate validation, uh, past validation is going to be an RFC. So uh, may I inquire to uh, how would you do that? You, you, did, you didn't mention your slides. No. And, <laughs> um, as far as I observe, there are uh, two methods at hand. One is to uh, waiting for the OpenSL to support it, the new OID. And the other would be, well, let's uh, just rewrite the mo mo a separate module to support this function. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> support of validation reconsidered. Um, we had it in the 2.x uh, series of the validator as a uh, global config because this was before the time that we uh, discussed that uh, a object identifier on certificates would be used. Um, we haven't done it in this one yet. It wouldn't be difficult for us to do it, but we were waiting to see where the, uh, uh, the, the, the standard goes mm -hmm. and the discussion about you know how it should be deployed because the moment that we would publish a certificate with a new OID in it, things will break. So we need to have a discussion there. And yeah, one open issue there is um, if you use these new OIDs, can you use a mix or can you not use a mix? But what do you need to validate it? It's not entirely clear yet. The document as specified basically says this is how it could work in various cases. 
But we need to have that discussion, I think, about you know what is an acceptable deployment model here before we do the, um, the RP code, because otherwise we may end up redoing it. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really see the point in, in going ahead of that. But that being said, it's, it's very easy for us to do this. We are not relying on, on OpenSSL. It's all a local implementation. We already keep track of the, let's say, the validated resource set um, concept, because in our mind, any, any certificate in the chain can use the inherit uh, attribute, let's say. So we already keep track of what resources go with a certificate. And changing this to something where we say, if there's an overclaim, accept the intersection is not difficult for us. So that's not on the uh, critical path. Thank you. All right, Dima, you're up. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dima from ZDS. As one of the authors <clears throat> of this document, I would like to brief the update. Uh, before touching upon the very subject, I would like to reiterate uh, the uh, motivation of the reason why we do this. Um, are we suggesting uh, that uh, implementer skip reading all those uh, RPK related, related documents? Absolutely no, because anyone who wants to comprehend this new technology can't be exempted from reading the necessary documents. Um, Actually, um, I see uh, this document could uh, serve as a manifest for all necessary RP functions. Uh, if I remember correctly, there is RFC uh, 6434 uh, IPv6 not requirements. I believe we are doing the similar things. Um, and now we believe implementers should do more than the, uh, what RP requirements are because um, uh, the implementers need to know how to reflect all the function, functions of RP uh, as they are making software design. So I really think this argument could make this work uh, more necessary. So that's the uh, clarification of the motivation. Sorry. Moving along to the overview, um, this document, uh, well, the current version is zero one. It's the update for the first time since it was adopted. And we also expect this document to be an information IFC that provides a single reference point for uh, requirements for relying party software for use in the RPK. Okay, here come the changes. Above all, um, we add the RPK, the RPK, uh, repository Delta protocol uh, when we mentioning the synchronization mechanism supported by target repositories. Um, and second, we have made the reference to RFC 6487 more detailed with the new granularity of sections. So not just telling people to go to the RFC to search for what they want. And um, we also add a paragraph that indicates the amended procedure uh, to handle accidental overclaiming as specified in the validation reconsider uh, document, which, uh, by the way, is about to be RFC. Um, in last version of this document, we left um, the way RP uh, uh, handle stale or invalid manifest as a TBD, and it has been complemented like this. Um, we also uh, add the security consideration sections by emphasizing both backup and uh, secure transport of the uh, validated cache. Okay, that's all. Um, this photo was taken by the 
to all the dogs living cat recently in India. Well, I can tell from the tiger contact I contacted, the big cat is hungry for questions. <laughs> Thank you. So no question. No questions. No questions. This cat won't be fed up. Okay. Off we go. Thank you very much, everyone. And there, like I said earlier, twice or three times, please. Much of the discussion should go on the mailing list. Oh, we have the whole thing about transport security. Let me stand up. Leave the cat up. We can leave the cat up. All right. So Jeff's presentation. Jeff's not here. I don't think. Great. We can talk about him. He won't even know. Uh, Jeff's presentation basically said, as an implementer of, of a protocol, they have a lot of fun making their cool protocol do, do cool things, and then they go to the IESG, and the security AD slams his hammer down like Thor and says, hey, dummy, you have to protect this. And everybody either goes, I don't know how to do that, or they do what we did for CIDR and say, you have an awesome answer. It's called TCPAO, but nobody knows how to do it. So we're just going to do BGP MD5, and we're just going to do MD5 and, and until something better comes along. I think we actually said to use SSH, but anyway, the point of the matter is like you can create your own fictional thing to do that, mm -hmm. which seems not constructive. You can talk about using BGP MD5 and get the Thor hammer again from Stephen Farrell or his replacement, Ecker. Super awesome. Um, that's right. It's he's more like the Flash, I guess. So. Uh, Anyway, I guess Jeff's requesting that somebody put some time into sort of making a matrix of, I have a protocol, it's TCP or UDP, I care about identification of the far side and some uh, cryptographic assurance that the packet didn't get messed with on the way. Then I should use this or I should use this based on what they, what protocol you're using. If you want to do also get confidentiality, then you would have to do something else, like say IPsec or TLS. And then some information about how to actually implement those things as an, in operations and maybe some pointers to existing code would be great. I, this seems like a good idea to me. I don't necessarily think it's CIDR ops work. <laughs> in fact, it's probably a little more like grow work, but at least to do to write the document. But I would like, does anybody else think this is worthwhile? Perhaps again, not here. But. Or why does it not matter, Rudiger? Warren Kamari with no hats. Yeah. If we don't do this, or someone on the site doesn't do this, the standard answer is just going to be use, use TLS for everything. And unless you want all your routers doing TLS for everything, we might want to do something about it. Uh, Job Snyder's NTT. Uh, I think it's definitely worthwhile, worthwhile to try and profile the different use cases and applicability security concerns. But I'm also interested in improving the BGP protocol specifically in an operator-friendly way. An analogy would be when we SSH into a host, we want to see the fingerprint, we say yes or no, and it's cached and you know forever uh, uh, that material can be used to securely do stuff. And I, uh, TLS is not the right solution here, but something lightweight, something that is transferable from device to device, something that doesn't require operators to jump through hoops to share secrets, something that is not encrypted on the wire so we can still debug it, that would have my interest. So I think there's perhaps multiple initiatives that uh, could flow from this. It sound, just to clarify, it sounds like what you're saying is the matrix of what to do if you have this or that problem or this or that protocol is interesting to you. Yes. Thank you. John Scudder, sounds like a problem for CARP. Oh, wait. Um, <laughs> as Rigger points out. Fortunately, it, CARP is a fish, so the tiger's happy. Yeah, CARP is a fish, and it started to smell bad, so it died. Or maybe it, maybe it happened in the other order. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so, so I, I also would like to see this work get done somewhere, because obviously I'm one of the people that gets the big headaches when... You know, Thor bangs his hammer down at you know silver hammer on my head. Um, yeah, a am I offering to do it? Uh, I did hear some threats about a design team when I was in SAG, and 
I neither run screaming nor did I raise my hand and volunteer, but there's a whole lot of people who think a whole lot of problems are the problem to solve. So I, as much as I despise problem statements, um, that's probably the first piece of work to get done is to just figure out which problem or problems it is that we want to solve and then we can decompose it from there. Thank you. Russ Housley. So uh, I also was in SAG. And this all started when I was security area director, so that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and then when I was IETF chair, I got the routing ADs, the ops ADs, and the security ADs together, and we bashed out this. And this led to TCPIO and CARP and a whole bunch of things. And it's like, please tell me why this is different. Because I feel like, it, you know, I was the cheerleader to round all those people up and get those specs developed. And um, as far as I can tell, the only thing that's changed is we came up with a more efficient Mac function since then. As you know, right now, the, that uh, TCPO specifies HMAC SHA-1, which is getting a little long in the tooth. But, okay, we could use GMAC. So, okay, we got to specify an OID and we're done. Is that really it? <laughs> um, actually, it would be nice if something actually had TCPO in it. Exactly. There's one implementation, right? Where? And, Juniper somewhere, but it was probably draft Monica still. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so anyway, the, my point is if, if there's really a need, the people are here to do the work and how. Okay. Thanks. I would also recommend, or just note that we, I think we're into time for cookies or some business, but I'll check while you're talking, John. Not according, not according to my calendar. My calendar says we have another half hour for this room. But what the heck? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have you adjourn right now. That's fine. I, I was just getting up to say that I, I, you know, I could answer, you know, Russ's question, which may or may not have been rhetorical. Um, but I, I'm not sure what your intent is with, with raising the topic. Like, is, is this, are we discussing this topic in the room until we're done, or, or what? Sort of, yes, sort of making sure I'm not crazy, but. Randy Bush, um, the problem with MD5 is it solves the problem we have. <laughs> <laughs> Had 4808 and we have roll. Um, we have MD5 because we were being attacked and got TCP resets. Currently, Nothing is successfully attacking MD5. When that happens, maybe we'll go with our checkbooks and beat on the heads of the vendors, and they will give us TCPAO. In the moment, TCPAO doesn't exist. It's a fantasy. Why are we spending floor time on it? You're in the way. He was too no. polite to say it. Tom Petch. Um, this is the third time I've heard TCPAO this week. Um, the other two were the same presentation, saying when are we getting TCPAO? And the work the presenter said he conducted, uh, he took, was talking to a number of working groups. Um, if I can read out my list, um, IDR, PIM, PCE, BEST, PALS, RTG, WG. I wondered why Cyber Ops wasn't on his list. So there is quite a lot of activity on why aren't we doing TCPAO and is it the right answer and do we need a better SHA 256 or something? But um, yes, there the, are the other people interested uh, around the ITF. The, those were all protocol groups. This is an operations group. We can ask. We. This is part of the reason I'm, I had brought the topic up is if it's something that operations people think that they need, not necessarily AO per se, but if they need this functionality, mm -hmm. They need to speak to their vendor and maybe going to them and saying, here's some paperwork you should read. Please make it work for me. But the, the presentation was saying we did a survey. We went and spoke to the vendors. We went and spoke to the operators. And this is the answer we got back. So, so people are sometimes crazy. Yes. Totally agree. And 
there are lots of instances where having security of your routing protocol in flight is important to me. And I run a not small network. Hmm. I also have customers that are going to peer with me over the friggin' internet, which is crazy. Yeah, nobody should do that. John Scudder again. Um, so, okay, to answer Russ's question, which I think he asked sort of, uh, which was, you know, what the hell do you want from me? Is your, are the algorithms in there not making you happy? Um, did you want a different algorithm? The answer is no. Um, I mean, this isn't what Stuart actually said, but I think it's what he should have said. Um, and this is kind of what Jeff said at SAG also, is it's, it's not, a technological, not a technology problem primarily. We've got all the technology spec. The specs are pretty much fine as far as we know. Um, it's an economic problem, which is kind of what you were saying about checkbooks. And it's a process problem, which is kind of what Randy was saying about MD5 is fine. It would be nice not to get, you know, have to have the same damn problem or argument over and over and over again every time we send up something to the IESG. So I, to, to me, at least, as much as anything, this, you know, never-ending series of discussions in different working groups about AO is not about the technology of AO at all. It's about the what does the IETF do when reality is over here and desire is over there. And, you know, instead of having a, a hissy fit every single time someone sends over a, a draft, can we have one huge hissy fit and just get it out of our systems and then, you know, be done? So Warren Kumari, largely following up from that. Yeah, I mean, either better security or a good answer on why we don't need security for this. But having the same fight again and again and again is getting old. Sure. But I mean, every, I mean, we see it often where a draft comes up and they're like, TCP MD5, are you nuts? And then we go through this thing again on what it's there for and yeah. I like one thing that I get riveting glances or just kind of. Come on, Brian. That's okay. I was wondering well. for Huh? Kind of, kind of. At the time we did the router RPKI protocol, we actually did a dance on. Well, okay, uh, the the politically correct answer to security, unfortunately, wasn't available, and uh, we did a we did a dance, we did a dance, uh, and uh, that delayed the whole thing for some months or even more. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, uh, the enthusiasm for uh, kicking that stuff off from here is very limited. And that's actually somewhat a different situation from LDP or BGP, where the, T uh, where the MD5 deprecation hap happened post-fact. I suspect there are plenty of other protocols that are in very similar situation like we are here. And uh, yes, next time, if something is deprecated, we really have to ask the leadership that they take care that there is running code. Uh, Brian Wise, Cisco. So I was involved in the TCPO, as, as some of the rest of you were, I think. Um, <laughs> we we did that as a response to needing to replace an algorithm. We did that. I I think game over. We just need to get it implemented. Okay. And I'm sorry, as a vendor, I have to tell you um, that you have to tell us apparently to implement it, and that you'll buy stuff. But it just seems to be the way it works. I I I I, I do what I can internally, and okay. Um, so it seems like we've understood the problem, we solved the problem, we just don't have the implementation. Why should we have the implementations? I think uh, it's because we wanted to be prepared for when there were problems and we wanted to be able to react quickly. Okay. At the moment, we know what the problem is, we know how to solve it, we'll react whenever we have implementations. That's not as good. Rob Alstein, um, this isn't really about AO. It's worse than that. I don't know if you remember what we originally did with the RPK router protocol. It was going to be over SSH, just plain old SSH. We gave up on that because, well, we couldn't find anybody who implemented the server side for this or the client side for that. So we said, okay, we looked at this, we looked at that, we looked at TLS, we looked at AO, we looked at MD5. 
It turns out the intersection of the things people were actually willing to support was unencrypted TCP full stop, which is what people are using now. Okay. Still, right? This didn't go anywhere, right? That's still all anybody can use because for anything you name, someone doesn't implement their side of it because people don't care. Job Snyder's NTT. Um, as to implementing TCP authentication options, I'm not so sure if the operator community in the BGP world actually wants that. Um, if you talk about interdomain uh, eBGP, people really, really hate exchanging shared secrets. It, it leads to, it's not a technology problem, it's just people are sometimes ridiculous about this stuff. Uh, what I'm saying is TCP AO does not solve the uh, key sharing. So if we come up with something that, you know, um, and what I would also like to observe, everything that has been proposed so far, uh, TCP MD5, TCP AO, MACSEC, IPSEC, uh, SSH, TLS, DTLS, uh, it's all protecting the outside envelope. And I, be, I feel we have not yet explored enough of protecting uh, opportunistically by doing it inside the protocols themselves. But that is, of course, a big discussion. Randy Bush, Brian, what I'm hitting you over the head with my checkbook for is proper implementations of origin validation. It's broken on your routers. Don't tell me you want me to beg for TCPAO. This is cider ops. Give me the protocol. John Scudder, since Warren uh, volunteered me for, for some design team that hasn't been formed, I volunteer Job. Um, uh, the. <laughs> Yeah, that there, there were several beats there before that the, the wait what came back. Um, so, so I think you're right that uh, making it actually operationally useful might be might be a good idea. Um, I think that as far as I can tell, and maybe Russ can opine about this, it's AO is designed such that if you had a way that way to manage keys that wasn't stupid, you could just plug it into AO. So it would be valid to have the AO implementation. It would be valid to have uh, good key management. Um, it's a decomposable problem. Um, we can attack both pieces. Uh, Brian Wise, so uh, first point on, yes, the key management or how you would key management. So I was also co-chair of CARP and we actually had specifications, draft specifications, uh, anticipating that people would want to stop using pre-shared keys and instead using some kind of automated key management protocol. There was not enough interest to continue, so that died on the vine. That could be resurrected somewhere if there actually was enough interest. Um, the, uh, see, the other thing I wanted to mention is, I think one reason to talk about it in an office area, maybe not this one, uh, is what I was hearing, I think, little bits of in SAG is that um, there's issues or concerns about um, keychains, or how would you uh, how would you do uh, orderly key rollover? And I think that's a solved problem that needs to be just described. At least that's my opinion. Um, I could be wrong, and I should be told if that's the case. Uh, that it, maybe there's an operational document to be written that describes how to put this all together. Thank you. I think the end of that is not here. Still think about how to put a matrix together, and then Job is going to specify how to do BGP with some better security. All right. With communities. There's nothing else uh, on the agenda. I actually thought we were running a lot shorter than we were. So, okay. Or a lot longer, I mean. See you next time in Montreal. Bring your French. Yo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe. It's funny, you know? Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Did you also run the uh, right before? Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.